Hi everyone, I'm Elisha, I'm the Hardwired staff, and we have the president of Hardwired, Tina Ramirez here, and she's going to introduce our guest speakers today. Hi everyone, I'm Tina Ramirez, as Alicia said, and I'm really excited to be with you. This is the, the first session I've gotten to attend, and so I'm really excited about our guests today. As the um, president, I'll just share a little bit of my background. I have been engaged in Sudan, South Sudan politics for uh, over 20, about 25 years. It was the first country that I studied in college, and then when I got to work for the U.S. Congress, including Congressman Bill Arrakis, who's on with us today, I got to be a part of the Sudan caucus and and handle a lot of the Sudan policy coming out of the US Congress. So I traveled there in 2007 with uh, Ken Isaacs and Samaritan's Purse. I got to travel all through Nuba Mountains, Blue Nile, uh, Juba, Ye, and a lot of other places. And so I've been there several times since, but it's an honor for me to participate with you and to have you as a part of this training program. So thank you for being with us. And I'm very excited today about our two guests. So first, Congressman Gus Bilirakis, is a congressman from Florida, from the Tarpon Springs area. He and his family hail from Greece, and he can share a little bit more about that on this call, but he is a, um, a, ra a, a ranking member on the Energy and Commerce Committee, also on the Veterans Affairs Committee, and prior to serving in Congress, he served in the Florida State Legislature. So he brings a wealth of expertise and background in being able to talk about one the legislator at both the local and the national level, and also his uh, policy background experience on energy and commerce and some of the economic decisions that governments have to make. So I look forward to hearing from him. And secondly, we have Liz Hittos. Liz is a prosecutor and the chief of staff for the congressman. Uh, they worked together at, at a law firm before he served in Congress. And I can tell you that she is a prosecutor that you'll never wanna go up against because you'll lose. She is an amazing woman. She knows she's traveled to many countries and done a lot of foreign policy for the congressman as well. But as his chief of staff, she brings a wealth of expertise about how policy is really made and what happens in the back halls of Congress. You know, the congressman has one position and he has a staff that help navigate the policy making decisions that take place. So understanding that dual role and the importance of both of them is really critical as policymakers and for you as members of parliament. So without further ado, uh, welcome Gus, welcome Liz. It's great to have you here. So let me go ahead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and forth on questions with both of them. And the first one will be for Congressman Bill Arrakis. Of course. So Congressman, can you describe for me the relationship between being a legislator and having constituents that you serve? Uh, and you can focus specifically on your role as a legislative leader and a public servant. Well, yes. Uh, now, usually we're in Washington, D.C., uh, more than half, 50 percent of the time, and that's when we're, we're legislating. Uh, however, we do have district work periods where we'll be in the district, uh, and I represent roughly 700,000 people in the central part of Florida. Uh, the Tampa Bay area, the west central part of Florida. And so we have staff, but also I get involved in, in constituent cases uh, when it has to do with the federal government. So anything to do with the federal government, such as uh, Social Security checks, uh, if they're not receiving them, uh, you know, you, if you're 65 and, and over, uh, or, you know, generally 65 and over, there are some uh, exceptions to that. Uh, then they receive a, a, a check from the federal government because they pay in as workers uh, for during their lifetime prior to the, the age of 65. Uh, they pay into the system. So they're entitled to a, a government check. Um, and also any issues uh, that, we, that, that people want us to look into uh, as far as legislation is concerned, meeting with different groups. Uh, constituents in general uh, to get their ideas because we're supposed to be representatives of the people. So most of our ideas come from the people, the constituents. And uh, so that's my part in the district. Now I live at home and, and, uh, and so I live in Florida, in Central Florida, but I come, during the week, for the most part, we come up to Washington, D.C. We fly up to Washington, D.C. 
and vote on different pieces of legislation that are in the best interest of our constituents. Uh oh, lots of volume. Great. Thank you, guests. <laughs> Thank you, Congressman. And Thank you, of course. Yeah. Can you share for me what is the difference between when you worked in the state legislature in Florida versus the federal government? How is it different? Well, uh, we represent a, a smaller group of constituents. For example, as I said, we represent approximately 700,000 uh, as a member of Congress, U.S. Congress. And, uh, but in the legislature, it's 125,000. Uh, we travel to Tallahassee, uh, which is the capital. So every state has a capital. Uh, and it's a part-time legislature. So uh, we have 60-day sessions. Of course, we have committee meetings, too, prior to that in a lot of cases. But it's a part-time legislature. So whereas I would have another job. Uh, but, but in Congress, we can only have one job, and that is to serve the people. Now, there are different issues, too. So, uh, for example, we focus in the legislature, the state legislature, we focus more, mostly on education issues. That's a great part of the budget. And public safety uh, issues. Uh, so, so different issues on the, on the federal level. Um, and, and, and the state level. We don't focus at all on the state level for the most part on foreign affairs, for example. But of course, that's a big issue. So it's all based on the Constitution. Uh, and, and we have an amendment that says that if it's not a federal issue, then the, the issue should go, if it's not specifically stated in the Constitution, then the state legislatures or the local governments I should make those decisions on behalf of the constituents. I hope that was good enough, but maybe Liz might want to add something as well. Yeah. So Liz, let's turn to you. Can you tell me a little bit about your role for the congressman in his office, especially providing legal counsel and navigating some of these issues as well? Sure. Yeah. I appreciate it, Tina. Thanks for having me. It's the best job in the world. It's uh it's an incredible uh, opportunity to serve in, in what I think is the greatest legislative body in the history of the world. Now, don't get me wrong, Congress has its issues and, and we are always way at the bottom of approval ratings, but for all intents and purposes, it really is the greatest legislative body in the world and, and it's, it's an honor and a privilege to serve and especially under Congressman Gus Galarakis, who really is a servant of the people. He's a public servant. He's certainly not doing it for uh, trying, to trying to get rich doing it. And in fact, his wealth has decreased as a result of doing it. But um, it, so it's, it's a multifaceted role. Um, the role of chief of staff is not only monitoring the staff. We have two offices, two sets of offices, one in Washington, D.C., of course, and then one uh, or at least multiple offices down in the state of Florida. Uh, our district. And so we have about eight to nine staffers up in the DC office and eight to nine staffers down in the district office. And the goal is to monitor them, manage them, uh, manage the legislative team to determine what type of legislation the congressman is going to be filing, what he's going to be voting on, making vote recommendations. Um, also managing uh, the legislative correspondent to make sure that when constituents uh, write into the office that they get a response in a timely fashion. For instance, we get on a, an average of about 2,400 letters or emails a week from constituents, and we have to respond to those within a two-week time period. More often than not, it's usually within a 72-hour time period, but every single one of those people deserves a response, whether we, we agree with them or not. Um, I also manage the communications department, making sure that messages that get out from the congressman, whether in a press release or in a tweet or social media or or any other fashion um, gets reviewed and that the messaging is on target with the congressman's uh, wishes, desires, his, his perspective, his, his philosophy. Um, also manage the, uh, the political end of it to ensure that, you know, uh, you know re-election comes around every two years uh, in this Congress, as you know, it's the way the framers set it up. So that members of the, of the House would always be in touch or closest to the people to ensure that they're getting served the way they, the way they should be. And so I also manage the political end of it. And then of course, as you mentioned, 
um, the legal end of it. You gotta make sure that the congressman is comporting with all the, the, the rules and regulations of Congress. Uh, make sure that he's following the rules of House Administration Committee and also the Congressional Ethics Committee. Um, lots of rules related to, to, to the Ethics uh, Committee. You know, how he can spend money that's being issued to his office through the member's representational allowance. There's a certain budget that each member of Congress gets. And we have to make sure that, that those dollars are being used in accordance with, with the rules that the Ethics Committee sets up. Make sure that the to, in order to prevent members of Congress from becoming corruptible, uh, there's gift bans. Uh, for instance, he can't even accept uh, a cup of coffee from a lobbyist um, uh, so as to avoid any appearance of impropriety uh, to make sure that he's not being bought or his vote's not being bought. Um, and so it, it's, it's very, uh, everything is highly scrutinized. And as you know, we have a very active media and, and even the appearance of impropriety would, would draw media attention. So I wanna make sure that, that he, he stays out of trouble in that regard. Uh, luckily, he's a great member of Congress. He's hyper careful. Uh, I don't have to worry about him. He always makes sure to do the right thing. Um, so in any case, it's, it's a pretty a full time job 24 seven, uh, but it's fun and it offers an incredible opportunity to get to travel to places, let's say like Sudan, I haven't been to South Sudan, but, but uh, would love to travel there uh, and, uh, and, you know, also travel the world and see amazing places and meet amazing people. Thank you, Liz. And uh, it's definitely more than a full time job. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. Yeah, I don't, the I don't think. Yeah, yeah, Tina, I just wanted to add something, excuse me. Uh, one thing that's really unique about this country is that you don't have to uh, be a member, you know, we don't really have a class society uh, to speak of. Uh, and, and anyone, if they work hard, they work hard and they have a certain amount of talent, which you do, Tina, uh, you, you, can, you can rise above and, and you, you can become a legislator, uh, a member of Congress, a United States Senator, a pre President of the United States. Now, you know, we're both from, Liz and I are both from immigrant families. Uh, so, you know, we didn't have a, a leg up. Now, my dad was in the, in the Congress, uh, but he worked his way up there. And, uh, you know, so, so that's really neat. Uh, and, and I, you know, it's not who you know, it's, it's how hard you work. And, and that's so very true. Uh, now we do have some mil millionaires. Obviously we have a president that's, that's a millionaire, uh, but President Obama was not a millionaire when he was in office. So uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's great because everyone has an opportunity to succeed. Yeah. Well, I think that that's a really great point for our audience because as they're building a new country, uh, to understand the importance of like what you did, Gus, you went into the local political arena you, and then you worked your way up into eventually running for Congress and representing a much larger constituency. But this idea of representing a little people, letting your voice be heard and then continuing to serve the people and be the voice of the people and then uh, be a part of the government for the people and it is very important. So let's let me ask you another question because you're also uh, Greek and you're yes. part of the, you're the co-chair of the Hellenic Caucus in Congress. So how does your uh, background and identity as a Greek also inform how you make policy and how you also represent a broad swath of your constituents as well? Well, as far as, yeah, now, you know, the constituents come first, obviously. Uh, and we represent 700,000 constituents, but Greece is an ally of the United States, they're part of NATO, and of course the EU, uh, and uh, there's really no conflict there. So it's really advantageous to my country, uh, the US, that I have knowledge uh, in this area and, and, and I'm able, because I speak the language, the Greek language, I'm able to communicate with public officials uh, in Greece, uh, whether they come here or uh, you know, I go over there, I was a member of the NATO parliamentary uh, group. Uh, I think I'm an alternate now, but uh, it's always good to have that rapport. And then of course, uh, 
you know, with Cyprus as well, because most of the, the people that live on Cyprus are, are Greek speaking. Uh, so, and we formed the Hellenic Alliance, the Hellenic Caucus, my dad and uh, Carolyn Maloney, and, and these caucuses are bipartisan. So we have a co-chair on the Republican side and a co-chair on the Democrat side, just like Tina founded the, the Religious Freedom Caucus. And we have a Republican, we have to find a Democrat now, Tina. I think we're, we're pretty close in finding someone uh, because the other co-chair uh, unfortunately lost in the last election. But uh, so it's very important that we have knowledge in these areas around the world. And the fact that uh, I grew up as a Greek American uh, is, is very, uh, I think it's very beneficial to, to the United States. Just as uh, if you have a Sudanese American uh, that's in the, in, the, in the United States Congress, they have ties uh, with, with uh, their, their what, what, what you call the motherland country, the motherland. So uh, it, it's good, you have to work a little harder, but I'm not scared of hard work and our constituents come first, but there's always room uh, to help out an, another ally. Well, thank you, Gus. It's a great perspective to talk about how it can be um, really used as an asset for your country's <laughs> bilateral and international relations to help you strengthen your country, whether it's economically Absolutely. or national security wise. And, you know, it's interesting because South Sudan is very, in a very unique position right now with uh, President Bashir was just taken out of, of Sudan, of Khartoum, which is amazing. And I think a lot of people have been looking forward to that for a long time. And so now, they, uh, Salva Kiir, who's the president of South Sudan, has been very involved in those negotiations, even in, within Khartoum, on helping them in this transitional time. And so, uh, in some of the comments that I heard him say, he said, you know, we're one Sudan, kind of like John Gring's famous, famous statement of Sudan, that even though we're in two different countries now, we're still all Sudanese. And I think that's similar to what you're saying, is that there are relationships that can help you um, become better as a country and strengthen your country, that you don't need to... Um, see as a liability, but as an asset. Uh, That's the way I feel. Yeah. So uh, the next question is about government and accountability. Can you just talk to me a little bit about both you and Liz, the importance of transparency and accountability in government? And Liz talked a little bit about it with all the ethics regulations and everything that you take, you do, but more really to like policy. So you have, um, and government programs. So you have a lot of uh, you know, within your, within your job, within your duty on the committees, you are overseeing um, government accountability on different programs and policies. And so how important is that? And what does that look like? You can talk about it with respect to energy and commerce or the Veterans Committee. How do you uh, incorporate this transparency and accountability in the way that we um, oversee our government uh, services. Well, we, we, we would try to make everything uh, public because I don't have any, any classified information. If it were classified, I would not obviously uh, make sure that, uh, that it's kept uh, classified. We would do that, kept, keep it classified. But most of the information is public knowledge and we have an, a duty and a responsibility to get that information to our constituents. Uh, and, and we hold a lot of town halls, whether they're virtual or in person, uh, the, the press, the media uh, holds us accountable to a certain extent because it's a free press. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I feel that uh, I, in most cases, uh, now we have access to a lot of information, uh, maybe that the average person does not have. Uh, but we have a duty and a responsibility to get that information out to the people. Uh, if I make a vote, in more, most cases, I've got to take into consideration what my, how my constituents feel about a particular bill, legislation, policy, uh, and taking a stance. But again, if I do make a vote that may not be, that may be adverse to their positions, I have a duty to explain myself to them. So there is accountability, there's no question. Now, you know, we have some issues that are hardcore where they're principled votes. For example, I'm uh, very pro-life uh, and, uh, and I don't know, it's probably 50-50 in my district uh, with regard to that, uh, pro-life as opposed to pro-choice, but I, 
I feel that uh, that uh, we need to protect life, and and I and I feel that way, and and most people respect that. Uh, so that's something that I will not, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to hedge on that. Uh, but there are issues where you can compromise too, uh, and 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 that's part of governing. So. Uh, I don't know if you have anything else to add, Liz, with regard to that. Yeah, I, I was going to say, you know, Tina, the, the congressman is really active, not only in Washington, D.C., but a lot of the, the work that he does also takes place in the district. And as he mentioned, he has town hall meetings. He has uh, constituent meetings in the office. He does site visits. So constantly he's getting feedback from constituents. And so if a constituent says, hey, you know, the Veterans Administration backlog uh, has prevented me from getting a, uh, uh, an answer on my disability claim for the past three years. What's the deal? Uh, in the meantime, I'm suffering. Um, what's the deal? The congressman can take that back. And as you noted, through the committee, um, they can call witnesses from the VA administration. They have oversight hearings uh, to find out why there's a backlog. What is taking so long? What is it that you need um, to, to ensure that uh, my constituents are taken care of? And so the, the committee hearings are public hearings. Not only um, are, are the doors open for people to actually sit in the hearing, but they're televised. And, and the answers yeah, are, call, are open for us okay. all to hear. And, and, uh, and the, officials, uh, the officials have to be responsive. And so a lot of the Energy and Commerce Committee hearings, a lot of the VA committee hearings that the, that the congressman sits on is questioning uh, these uh, administration officials as to um, how they can better serve constituents and, and getting answers from them. Um, and so that, and of course, as the congressman mentioned, um, the media keeps everybody's on, uh, everybody on its toes. Oftentimes they reach out to us and say, hey, we heard that, that this is going on. Would it, you know, is that true? And if so, what are you going to do about it? And as a result, um, we respond to that. We do our own investigation again, whether it's through the committee, whether it's through the personal office, and appropriately respond so that the folks can get an answer and, and constituents can know that um, that their government is as transparent as possible. Um, and again, I'd like to think that uh, while we do have our faults. Um, and, uh, you know, we're not perfect. Corruption in the United States is not institutionalized like it is in other countries, and that's what makes the difference. Um, sure, you're going to have corrupt individuals, um, but those get rooted out. Those people get rooted out pretty fast, um, and they get, uh, they get the appropriate swift and just punishment that they deserve, um, and uh, we, by and large, uh, try and be as open, as transparent as possible, uh, and accountable. And that's why, um, that's why I think, again, the founders had it right when they said every two years, the uh, members of Congress have to be accountable to their constituents. Yeah. Thank you, Liz. I think you both, um, thank you, Congressman, explained both sides of this coin, which is one, being accountable and transparent with the constituents. And because really it's the constituents that vote us in and vote us out, ultimately and uh, in, at least in a constitutional republic like we have. But secondly, the importance of your oversight of the government, because as congressmen, your, your first duty is legislating and then um, you know these three sectors and balance of power that we have within our system, the president, the judiciary, and the Congress, Congress making laws and holding government accountable to enforcing them the way that you, that you determined that they should. And if they're spending money the wrong way or wastefully that you've appropriated, or if they're uh, you know, doing things that they shouldn't, or if they're not serving the people the way they should, like you said, with veterans affairs and other issues, then you get to hold them accountable. And that's what you're there for. So it's a very interesting um, perspective for, for uh, individuals and in countries where they don't have that experience. And so uh, they goes right in, Liz, with what you were saying to the next question, which is both of you are former lawyers. And I would love for you to share how respect for and confidence in the justice system is so central to, uh, you know, really having a civic government. So share a little bit about that and um, in, in both of your experiences. Well, uh, Liz could probably answer this a little better than I can, but 
Yeah, that, that's the difference in the United States of America. She brought this up. Uh, people are held accountable. They're prosecuted uh, for corruption because I'm sure, you know, corruption takes place in, in all, all, all over the world. Uh, but you've got to make sure that there's a, a justice system there and people are held accountable. Uh, and you want, of course, you want an equal justice system. And we have that in the, in the United States, in my opinion. Uh, the other thing is, uh, as far as oversight is concerned, I wanted to bring this up. You know, and I think maybe Liz covered this, but we have C-SPANs. Uh, so anyone in their homes can actually watch hearings and markups and votes on the floor uh, of the House of Representatives. So say, we've had C SPAN since 1979. So that is a public network uh, and it's not biased. So they're, what they're doing, they have cameras in the, in the hearings, cameras in the markups, cameras on the floor of the House of Representatives. So you're hearing directly from witnesses uh, testifying before the committee but also you're hearing from your members of Congress. So a lot of people uh, take advantage of that and, and they, they watch the members of Congress and that's how they hold them accountable. So uh, yeah, for the most part, I think that we have a good uh, justice system. And uh, Liz, you may want to elaborate as a former prosecutor as well. Yeah, sure. No, thank you. Um, I, I had a, a, the great honor of, of working as a prosecutor. In fact, I thought I was going to be a career prosecutor. Um, and um, for six and a half years, I, I prosecuted everything from, you know, theft, uh, misdemeanor theft cases to, to first degree murder. And so I have to say, uh, I had an, an incredible experience with the prosecutor's office in as much as, um, you know, we always were held accountable. You know, being a prosecutor, you're given an, an incredible amount of power. You have the power to put somebody to death in the state of Florida. Uh, the death penalty exists. Um, you have the power to, you know, impose a crime on somebody, um, potentially ruin their livelihood, to ruin their lives. So it's a, it's a vast amount of power that you are given. And so you have to be diligent and, and, and deliberative uh, in, in how you use that power. And I worked in an office in which um, the, uh, the, the chief prosecutor wanted to ensure that if we did file charges against somebody, that we could prove those charges beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, there's some instances where, you know, there's probable cause to make an arrest. Um, however, there might not be enough uh, evidence to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt. So in some instances, even though we believe that somebody committed a crime, um, I mean, there was probable cause that that person had committed a crime, um, we wouldn't file the charges because we figured that we couldn't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. So we always err on the side of, of um, freedom rather than imposing uh, a, an arrest and or a conviction against somebody. So I was very lucky to work within that type of a system um, in, in the state of Florida, in the Tampa Bay area. I, now I also spent time, more time actually on the criminal defense side. I actually defended people who were charged with crimes. Again, um, I worked with uh, I worked with the prosecutor's office that I had that I had the had been a prosecutor in, and so um, was able to oftentimes in scenarios in which my clients were facing the death penalty or life imprisonment, uh, work with the work with the prosecutor's office to impose a lighter sentence or to ne negotiate a better deal. And I always found that um, when you have honest people in those positions um, who take their job seriously, they're, they're, you're able to work with a justice system that's fair that's transparent, uh, and that's judicious. And so um, I've never had the experience of, of, of uh, being railroaded or having my clients be railroaded or, or um, as a prosecutor having to impose, um, a, a, you know, a charge against somebody that, that didn't deserve it. And so I, I'm, I was very lucky in that sense because really if you don't have a legal infrastructure that people trust, it's very difficult to have to, to run a country um, that uh, was uh, run a civil society. 
I mean, people have to have trust in the legal frameworks. They have to know that when they go to court or when they sign a contract with somebody, it's going to be enforced accordingly or, or that, you know, they're going to be treated fairly if they get arrested um, or if they get accused of a crime. If you don't have the very basics, the very fundamentals of a legal infrastructure that people can trust, um, then it's really difficult to, to set up civil society. So uh, that's the bedrock. Um, is is our constitution and the laws and the statutes that that uphold our constitution? Thank you for sharing that, Liz and and Congressman. I think especially the idea about trust in the system because that's really what makes America work, isn't it? Is that people are confident that you know when things aren't just, they can use their freedom of speech or expression to challenge it and not go to prison because of it, but get a fair kind of hearing that, that we have these basically checks and balances and basic rights and freedoms that everyone understands uh, throughout the society that makes it work. Um, so can, can you share a little bit about this idea of checks and balances? I mentioned it previously, but Gus, can you just share what does that mean in, within our constitutional republic? Well, we, we hold that what we do is like you said, uh, they're equal. Uh, you know, you've got the, the federal, I mean, you've got the, the, the legislative branch, uh, and that's the House and the Senate. You have the presidency, that's the executive branch, and then the judicial branch. So there, it's an oversight over the other, and one is not more powerful than the other. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, the legislators, are, are supposed to make law. And, and, then, and then the executive branch, which includes the President of the United States and the cabinet, they execute the laws. Uh, and, 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 but they shouldn't overstep uh, because there has to be a lot of rulemaking when you execute the laws. Uh, so the intent should be the same uh, as when it was when the legislators, the Congress, members of Congress created these laws. Uh, and then, of course, you, if the law is, is challenged, then it goes to the, to the courts, the court system. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have the, the Supreme Court is the highest court uh, in the land. So, you know, because we have these separate uh, checks and balances, that's what it means. We're checking and we're making sure that everything is balanced uh, and holding each branch uh, accountable. So uh, this is the way it works. Now, you know, it's sometimes it doesn't work as smoothly as we like it to, but it does work ultimately. Uh, so, you know, you have four, three, excuse me, three equal branches. Uh, as I said, the exact, the legislative branch, the judicial branch, uh, to make sure that the law, if it's challenged, that it's constitutional, uh, otherwise it will be struck down uh, and then, of course, you have the legislative branch, which includes the President of the United States and the Cabinet. Um, and they have certain duties, and they're set out in the Constitution. So you know, we have a great Constitution, and the, the founders uh, were very wise. And, you know, they, most of them came, obviously, well, they didn't all come from England. Uh, and they saw uh, some issues there. Uh, with the, the, the king had too much power. Uh, General Washington, who became president of the United States, wanted to make sure that we didn't have a king, uh, that, that we had a president that wasn't as strong like a king uh, to make decisions. And that's why he advocated, as well as other founding fathers, that we have these three equal branches to look over one another. Uh, and. Uh, and, and have the authority to overrule one another. Thank you. So one of uh, the next set of questions that I wanna ask about is related to your role as um, a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee. So um, Congressman, because uh, you're on this committee, can you describe for me, and your, your father was before you, so you yeah. have a lot of experience in this area. What is um, the importance of energy and commerce to within a society and in particular to the economy of a country? Well, it includes almost everything. 50% uh, of the legislation, at least 50%, I say 50, it's probably 60, 
Uh, it's the, the original committee in Congress, uh, but 50 to 60% legislation on the floor is from energy and commerce. And that's business uh, th between the states. So it really includes regulating businesses within the states. It includes almost everything. I serve on the, on the healthcare committee uh, and public health. Is, uh, that's the subcommittee under energy and commerce. Uh, and then also uh, we serve on the, and that includes Medicare, Medicaid, what have you. Uh, and then I also serve on the communications subcommittee. And, uh, and that has to do with telecommunications, uh, television regulation, uh, a lot of oversight over these agencies. Uh, it includes radio, it includes the internet. Uh, so uh, of course it has even more jurisdiction now because of uh, the internet and the social media. Uh, so it's an oversight committee over some of these uh, agencies. Uh, and of course we create law uh, and, and then and also we have jurisdiction over energy. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the energy is all about jobs. Uh, we want to make sure that, because uh, there are different forms of energy now, too, because it's very diverse. Uh, but uh, we want to make sure that, uh, that it, things are being done right. And we want to make sure there are no monopolies. Uh, and and that there's competition, free market system. Uh, and, and again, it's commerce between the states, uh, trade between the states, uh, business between the states, travel, the travel industry, the airline industry. Uh, we have jurisdiction over all that. And uh, so, so it's a very diverse, broad jurisdiction. Uh, before 1994, we even had jurisdiction over financial services. Believe it or not, Tina, that was before your time. Uh, but Newt, who is the Speaker of the House, decided to create a separate financial services committee. Uh, so that's energy and commerce. And then Veterans Affairs, uh, of course, our heroes, those who have served uh, in the Army, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, uh, even uh, the National Guard as well. So, so this is uh, something that, uh, that's really close to my heart, taking care of our soldiers. Uh, and, uh, and we file legislation uh, to help them, to take care of them, as President Lincoln wanted, uh, and their families, uh, the widows and widowers as well. Uh, and and then, so that's what we do. But on the floor of the House of Representatives, we vote on everything, all committees of jurisdiction. And, uh, you know, for example, I was on Foreign Affairs. Tina worked with me on Foreign Affairs for years. Uh, and then also I was on Homeland Security prior to me getting on Energy and Commerce. You can't do it all. That's why we have 435 representatives nationwide. And each representative serves roughly 700,000 people in this country. And then, of course, you have the United States Senate. And we have two United States senators. That was a great compromise. Uh, two United States senators from each individual state, and we have 50 states. We also have territories, uh, but they're limited. Uh, like, for example, Puerto Rico, uh, we have a representative from Puerto Rico, but she cannot vote on the floor, uh, only to break a tie, something like that. I don't want to get into it too much. Uh, and, but they vote in committee. Uh, we have a representative from Guam, who's a good friend of mine. That's also a territory, and uh, she has the opportunity to vote in committee. So, Liz, you want to add anything? No, I think I think you covered it pretty well. Good. So, just a final couple questions for both you and Liz. Uh, first, what are some of the issues that you have to consider when you're looking at um, how to encourage um, or promote foreign investment into America, and you know, dealing with energy and commerce? What are some of those issues? And then, secondly, Liz. If you could speak to just this, this issue of the U.S. sanctions with um, South Sudan right now and what the government of South Sudan could do to encourage the U.S. and other foreign uh, countries to begin investing in their country. So it's kind of a two-part question. So if Gus, you want to take you know, what you look at in the committee on in, in incorporating foreign investment here, bringing foreign investment here, and if Liz, you could talk about advice for them uh, in, with respect to the sanctions and what they could be doing to 
Encourage well, Liz, why don't you go ahead and take, take them both and incorporate them both uh, into your answer. We, we uh, you know, we encourage foreign investment, obviously. Uh, you know, obviously there, there, there are a lot of people that say let's, let's just use U.S. manufacturers, uh, what have you. But, you know, I'm more of a free trader, uh, but it has to be fair trade. Uh, for instance, China is is not fair trade. That's why the president is uh, is uh, you know trying to make a, a better deal with China. But uh, you know, I'm not of the opinion that we shouldn't have foreign investment, and I feel that we should invest uh, throughout these countries, particularly uh, you know the the countries that are just getting started, uh, not necessarily third world or what have you, but just getting started. Uh, and they're allies of the United States. So, uh, you know, I'm a diplomat. I, I think that we, we, well, I'm not an isolationist. So we, we need to help out our, our friends. So anyway, let's go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I agree. For, foreign investment is a great thing, whether it's in the United States, other countries looking to invest in the United States or vice versa. Uh, you know, anybody that wants to help expand or grow the U.S. economy, um, by pro by providing jobs uh, and creating revenue is a good thing, um, but we have to make sure that their interests are in the right place. Now, if you got a you know a, a monolith like China who's looking to expand 5G uh, um, technology and infrastructure in the United States, that gives us pause. Um, they they are a national security uh, uh, issue uh, threat. Uh, so. So countries like China um, are, are obviously uh, areas where we have to think twice about. But others who are looking to to bring their manufacturing plants here, create revenue here, create jobs here, um, is a good thing as long as they, ha they have their our, uh, interests in mind. Now, you know, as it relates to South Sudan, I mean, you know, the United States should be proud. We, we had a large hand in creating the newest country in the world, I think, in, in 2011, um, it was. In fact, our former staffer, John Tomaszewski, uh, who worked in Juba for many, many years, I, I kind of jokingly uh, call him one of the founding fathers of South Sudan because he worked for so many years um, trying to create this independent uh, state. And he was so proud and still is proud today Although obviously there's been lots of starts and stops and, and, and problems along the way as is birthing a new nation. You know, United States had issues when it first, uh, you know, back in the 18th century when it first became a nation. In fact, we had a civil war nearly 100 years after our creation that nearly tore the country apart. So South Sudan can overcome its problems. It, it has to put aside um, tribal interests, personal interests, you know, financial interests, uh, and, and come together for, for a nation, again, that was the newest nation in the world, newly created um, to avoid the issues that it had with, with Sudan and with Bashir in, in power in Sudan. This is a, a real opportunity for them to, to reset and restart. Unfortunately, because unity government was was out of reach and, and peace agreements and ceasefires had been violated, sanctions had to be imposed. Um, you know, it's one of the, the, the sticks that the United States uses um, in order to, to get countries to, um, you know, do the right thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, we probably, we have a hand in, in some of the troubles because the Obama administration um, didn't follow through with you know, certain economic aid to help uh, to help South Sudan um, get to where it needed to be. But now we're in a posture where South Sudanese leaders need to know that um, that the United States will be there to help them is once they get you know again um, legal infrastructure set up where there's um, entities and and agencies that um, are. are can help the people, that there's a trust built between the people and the government um, where arms are laid down um, and talks need to begin and people need to act in the best interests of the nation as a whole. Um, then the United States, I think, can lift some of these sanctions that they've imposed against leaders that have been charged with uh, Magnitsky Act violations 
Um, and of course, I know the UN uh, has imposed sanctions, especially as it relates to arms. I mean, in a country where where peace is fledgling, um, there there probably shouldn't be any arms that are traded um, uh, so as to be used against you know one another. Um, so they have to prove. I know they they they've sort of followed the metrics and they're 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 moving along um, in towards a direction that shows that they can um, they can have a unified government, but um, there really has to be major steps taken uh, to prop up civil society, again, to ensure that the rule of law uh, is preeminent above all else, because without the rule of law, you're just gonna have a breakdown of society. Um, the rule of law all, always has to be uh, preeminent and it always has to uh, take precedence um, over tribal interests again and over individual interests. Um, so, you know, I think that I think that with the appointment of an envoy, finally, um, that that the Trump administration is really looking forward to ensuring that um, South Sudan uh, becomes part of uh, the, 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 you know, the, the world of nations and that I know Secretary Pompeo um, has been kept a keen uh, eye uh, on, on South Sudan to ensure that um, bad actors, even let's say like China, um, doesn't try and undermine uh, the government over there and exploit the country for its resources. Um, you know, there's so many natural, natural resources there um, that they have to ensure, especially with the world revenue sharing, that it benefits the people of South Sudan uh, in a way that's meaningful and helpful. So I, I know that Gov uh, Congressman Bill Rax has, has taken a particular interest in Sudan. In fact, I like to think that, <laughs> he might dispute this, but last March when he visited, and I had the chance to be there with him, when he visited Sudan and we visited Khartoum uh, during during the violent protests, actually, that were taking place, actually, the protesters were not violent. It was the government that was coming down hard on, on peaceful protesters, um, shooting them. Uh, many had been killed. Um, Congressman Bill Arrakis met with a host of um, government officials in Sudan from the Speaker of the Parliament to the Foreign Minister to the Interior Minister to everybody really except for Bashir obviously um, and within weeks and, and the congressman had actually demanded to see um, Sudanese American who had been imprisoned for protesting um, he had called for the government to stop the violence against the protesters he had called for the government to um, to uh, you know, allow uh, to uh, political prisoners to be released. He actually met with with former political prisoners, met with journalists, um, and within two weeks of his return back to the United States, the Bashir's government fell. Uh, so it was it was I like to attribute that to the congressman's visit, mm -hmm. and, and he was the first I think American elected official to visit in, in a long time, and so I think it had a really positive effect. And uh, I'm proud of the work that he did over there. Well, Congressman and Liz, I just want to thank you so much for doing this because I can only imagine how encouraging it's been to all the members of parliament and the uh, members of the government over there and the Energy and Commerce Committee and others that are seeing this and hearing one about your support and your hope for them, but also just you know how hard it is to actually you know, to serve and to to, to run a government, to legislate, that you're navigating so many different um, issues, but that really at the core of it, it's trust in you as a leader. And you have that trust in your constituents. You, um, you're, you're elected by huge margins every year. And it's because people do have that trust in, in your leadership. And that's such a critical component of building a society based in the rule of law, based in justice. And so thank you for modeling that, for that's sharing pleasure. with us. For, and for all of your leadership in Sudan and in South Sudan. And I am excited for them to hear from you personally. And this is just the beginning of the conversation, but thank you for, for all that you both do and um, for, for really making, making their path forward, uh, you know, a priority in your office. So thank you. Thank you, Tina. I appreciate it very much. And I, I hope we helped out because, uh, you know, I really think we're in the position 
to make a difference uh, here and you know in the greatest body I know I'm biased but it's true uh, the greatest body in the world and uh, we want to help out our friends so thank you very much and, and God bless you Tina for what you do as well